Greetings and welcome to how I think I got a 120 on 120 on the TOEFL in under 24 hours. Now, no, that is not a flex. No, I'm not exaggerating. I actually did prepare for this entire exam in one day and that's purely because I forgot it was scheduled for the next day. So be a little more responsible than me, but at the same time, something worked out. Okay, real quick, this isn't going to be like other TOEFL videos where I'm going to explain exactly what the TOEFL is, what the TOEFL is about. That kind of content is already out there. We're going to jump straight into what I think are the most effective tips to acing the four sections of the TOEFL. To 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 How did I do well on this exam? Also, I don't think I asked for this in a video explicitly. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. It really helps a lot. It really helps me figure out whether this content is actually helping people or are people just watching it and being like, wow, what a boring, unwatchable person and just like dipping and never coming back. So yeah, it'd be nice if you could smash that little red button down there. Thank you. What does the TOEFL really want to know? It's basically a test that measures your proficiency in English. This test is just that you don't English to speak English. And I think that was my first line of Hindi on this channel for a video that's all about speaking in English. How, how apt? There are four sections in the TOEFL. You have speaking, you have reading, you have writing, and you have listening. We're going to break down all four of those sections and I'm going to give you three to five tips that I think are really, really helpful. So, number one, the reading section. The reading section is, in my opinion, what usually intimidates people the most. And I have five key tips when it comes to this entire exam. Number one, passage comes first. There are going to be so many tips that say skim the passage and then read the questions or read the questions first and then skim the passage. That is going to slow down you a lot because if you read the passage thoroughly, you'd be able to answer 80 to 90% of the questions that passage has to offer right after it without looking back even once. A lot of people have a habit of really trying to speed through the entire passage because you know, time is a very big factor in your mind. But I can guarantee you if you spend two and a half to four minutes per passage, you are going to be able to answer almost all questions without constantly having to go back and forth because it's just really inefficient and also, it does tend to freak you out if you feel like you haven't understood the passage after you finish it. Like when I finish a passage and at the end of a paragraph, I'm like, okay, what did I just read? You tend to go back at the beginning of the paragraph, start again, and then go back and start again. And you're just stuck in a rut. Try to take your time, slow yourself down, and you will be able to go through it with ease. Number two, know your weaknesses. It is very, very important when you're attempting the TOEFL to understand what kind of passages you're going to take more time on. The TOEFL has a variety of reading passages. You're going to have science-based passages, you're going to have a history-based passage, you're going to have a politics-based passage, possibly something about the industrial revolution, something that is economic related, and you should know what kinds of information you're much more familiar with and what kinds of information you're much better at digesting, assimilating, and then answering questions on the basis of. So for me, for example, biology related passages were extremely difficult for me to comprehend. And I don't know why, possibly because I hated biology, but when it came to something like the evolution of a particular species, I would take so long trying to read those passages because one, they're extremely dense. Two, they just have a lot of complex academic terms that I really was thrown off by initially. Why did my face just become bright? So if you know what passages you're bad at, you're going to be better at taking them on the official test day because you should try and practice them a lot more. If you're buying the official TOEFL books, make sure you prioritize passages you're not that great at. On the flip side, try to understand what kind of passages you immediately jump to. And if you don't jump at a passage, really try to make yourself. Because when I took five practice reading passages, for example, I'm going to put all of their times here. You're going to notice that one of their entire passage, which is how much time I took to finish entire reading passage and then all of the questions, one of the times is extremely small compared to the others. And when I looked at it, I realized why. It was all about filmmaking and it was all about how Edison had developed a technology that helped to project moving images on a big screen. Now that is something that I'm really interested in. And I realized that when I was reading that passage, I constantly asked myself, oh, what is this passage trying to tell me? Oh, what did Edison do next? And I was invested in what I was reading. And if you can get yourself to be invested in any passage on the TOEFL, I can guarantee you're not only going to be A, a lot faster while reading it, but B, you're going to have a much more whole understanding of it. Number four, when it comes to vocabulary, a lot of people do get taken aback by a bit because they don't understand how well developed their vocabulary should be, whether they should understand all of the meanings of the words, how they should prepare for it. And I think the basic way 
to help you solve all of these doubts is just by learning and coming across more new words. And the way I did that was by reading one particular book. And this is a book that's so old, my father read it when he was in high school to build a better vocabulary. It's called, as the name suggests, How to Build, one sec, can you see it? It's called How to Build a Better Vocabulary by an individual called Rosenblum. And you might be asking what's the benefit of a book like this? And number one, it's not too big, which is really good if you don't like reading too much. But B, it really helps you break down the root of a word. 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 And I'm going to give you a quick example. This is a word I remember from this book and it's called infra-caninophile. Now, this isn't the difficulty of a word you're going to be getting on the TOEFL, but it is a word you might be looking at and going, what the heck is that? Like, I have no clue how to approach a word like that. Now, if you break infra-caninophile into three parts, you're going to get infra, you're going to get canino, and you're going to get file. Infra basically means like infrared, so something that's under. You're looking for something beneath the surface. Canino is canine, which if you can't tell means dog. And file is a Latin root word which talks about love. So infra caninophile actually means lover of the underdog. See, in that way, it's very easy to break down a word that might intimidate you at first by looking at the roots. And this book helped me do that so, so much. And I would definitely recommend it to you if you're going for any English exam, whether it's the GRE, whether it's the SAT, whether it's the TOEFL, um, a good vocabulary will always help you. Now, on to the next part, which is speaking. The speaking section is possibly the bane of every international student or any individual who's trying to give the TOEFL because either because of your accent, either because of the fact that you're not as fluent, a lot of people do lose a lot of points over here. And I really, really, really try to hone in on my communication skills throughout high school. So even though I did practice for this test in under 24 hours, the skills that helped me get those 30 points were skills I had developed over a long period of time. These are my tips when it comes to trying to become a better speaker, trying to become a more confident speaker, and most importantly, just feeling natural when you're communicating in a language that's not your first language. Number one, you have to look at how the TOEFL evaluates the speaking section. The TOEFL has a software which alongside a person evaluates what you're saying and how you're saying it. And there are a few metrics it uses, which I want to explain to you because if you understand those metrics, it's a lot easier to crack them. Number one, we have speaking rate and sustained speech. Number two, we have pause frequencies and repetitions. And number three, we have vocabulary depth. Now, number one, which is speaking rate and sustained speech. When you're taking a test like the TOEFL, the examiner is going to be checking how many words you are speaking at per minute or any sort of counter. It's very important for you not to be too fast and not to be too slow. A comfortable speaking rate is the rate I'm speaking at now. It's also important to understand that for about 80% of this video, I will be going a little faster than you should be going because I'm just a naturally fast speaker and I had to tone that down for the TOEFL examination. Number two, sustained speech. When you're giving the speaking section in the TOEFL, it is very important to keep speaking. You don't want to give too many interruptions in your examination because you only have 45 seconds to deliver this speech and it's going to be a very tight amount of time for you to fit all of the reasoning you want to or all of the personal explanations and anecdotes you want to. So in those instances, you do not want to run out of time, which is why giving too many spaces or going like, which is basically too many spaces, is not something that I would recommend. At the same time, you have the second category, which is pause frequency and repetitions. And that reinforces what I said before. You don't want to be taking too many pauses apart from pauses you are taking for emphasis, just like I did over there. You're going to need to take some pauses from time to time. And that is just to make sure that the words you are delivering, the way you're communicating is a lot more impactful, concise, and it is conveying what you want to convey. Now, the last part, repetitions. You don't want to be using words like um, so, but, and then giving a long space after that. Because as speakers, if you're not too comfortable with the language, you tend to rely on a set amount of phrases. And I can give a personal example. In like two videos ago, I kept saying at the end of the day and people started to notice. So if you're going to be speaking in any speaking test whatsoever, it's very important to prepare by recording yourself talking about any topic and try to do a word counter on some of the phrases you use. And I can guarantee there's going to be that one thing that was my notebook, that you say all the time, if I remember correctly, in my honest opinion. At the end of the day, likewise, fair enough. Those are all things that we tend to use to just fill in space. And they're things you can avoid by practicing. 
The last bit is vocabulary depth. Don't worry too much about this because if you're using words you're unfamiliar with, it's going to be more disadvantageous to you because you're not going to sound natural. It's very important in your TOEFL speaking section to sound like you have a command and grasp over what you're saying. The last thing that a lot of people ask is, okay, that's great, but how do I become a better speaker? How do I become more confident while talking? How do I make sure that, you know, I'm not taking gaps, I'm not saying, um, the best way is just to practice. I mean, I'm a YouTuber. I sit in front of the camera at least five times a week and I'm talking to it. That is the best way that I've learned to hone my communication skills. If you're in school, for example, participating in debates, participating in theater, all of those things are going to sharpen your communication skills and really make sure that when it comes down to taking a test, in under 24 hours, you're able to go in and deliver and execute and get the results you want. These aren't things that you can develop in just 14 days. When it comes to things like speaking, when it comes to things like reading, you need to be doing it over a long period of time, which is why starting earlier, not related to the test, reading for pleasure, speaking because you want to try out a new extracurricular activity. Those are the ways you get to actually develop these skills and make sure they become some of your biggest strengths in the future. And the last thing about speaking, I would say, is that when you're trying to answer a question, try to give it some form of structure. Don't use a template, but give it structure so that someone on the listening end is able to categorize your information and understand and almost predict what's coming next. So if you say, for example, I believe that online learning is not as effective as offline learning for these three reasons, they're going to know you're going to say one reason, two reasons, three reasons. They can expect a particular answer from you. And if they can expect something, they will be more familiar with it when they encounter it. And if they are more familiar with it, they're more likely to treat it as an acceptable answer. Just psychology 101 and communication 101. So giving structure to your answer, being very comfortable with how you're talking. And if you've not taken the TOEFL yet, trying to sharpen your communication skills over a long period of time by participating in as many extracurricular activities you can. And if not, just open your phone camera and start talking to it about any topic in one minute. And I can guarantee you will see results over a period of time. That's everything I have on speaking. The last two are going to be fairly quick because I don't think there's too much to say on this that hasn't been said before. But when it comes to listening, the most interesting skill that I found when writing down notes is doodling. I think that if you draw small vector icons of what you're doing, it's really, really easy to understand what you were trying to say instead of writing whole sentences. So for example, if I was supposed to say, I am going to the shop, I draw a rightward arrow, draw a little heart and put an S in the heart. I've saved like a good 10 to 15 seconds on writing and it's a very informal doodle that I can access whenever I want to. So I think it's super helpful to doodle if that's how you want to take notes. Number two, don't always try to write the biggest takeaways possible because those tend to be one, very long when it comes to sentences and two, information you're not going to understand till you reach the very end of the listening section. The biggest mistake you can make is making an inference before you're sure of it. And when it comes to taking notes, I found that I take notes of the things that are very small, very factual and things I tend to forget. For example, if someone is saying, Oh, I went to the bazaar, which was one road down, two rights, etc. It's a direction. You're not sure if they're going to ask a question about the direction, but I would write down that direction rather than writing about why this character is going to the bazaar. Because I know that at the end of that entire listening comprehension, their reason for doing it is something I'll remember because, you know, it's a purpose. But it's those small factual things that tend to slip your mind. And when they slip your mind, it's very hard to try and remember what it was that you heard. So that is why I say when you're taking down notes, try to take down notes of those small factual things you can tend to forget and won't be able to recollect rather than the bigger picture themes, purpose oriented ideas that were presented to you in a listening passage. The third thing I have about the entire listening passage is that you cannot, cannot be distracted. And this happened to me actually in my speaking section. I put my headphones on and I realized that everybody else was in the speaking section as well. So the kids to the left of me, the kids to the right of me, were all speaking at the same time and it can be very distracting. So you have to tune out of every single thing when you're giving this listening section, sorry, when you're taking this listening section, because if you turn right and for even 15 seconds you get distracted, that can be enough to throw you off your path. And once you get thrown off your path, if you freak out because of it, it's just a snowball effect and you've effectively lost that entire section's point value. So those are the three big things I have for listening. Number one, 
Doodle if you can. Number two, try to note down the small factual pieces of information. And number three, please, for the love of God, do not focus on anybody else's work. I know it's really hard to do, but just be in the present moment, look into your own screen and you'll be good to go. Lastly, when it comes to TOEFL writing, there are three key steps that I think are involved in the writing process. There are three key steps that are involved in the writing process. Number one, you have before writing or the ideation stage. Number two, you have writing. And number three, you have post writing. Now, in my opinion, the most critical phase is the pre-writing stage. What are you going to write about? Which side are you going to pick if they ask you to present your views for or against a particular topic? Do you have the constructive arguments you want to lay out? Creating that structure and that first draft is very important because that is the Bible for what you're going to be doing in the next 15 to 20 minutes. When you're actually writing, you're going to constantly refer back and say, okay, this entire paragraph is supposed to be about how Online learning isn't as effective as offline learning because cheating is extremely easy. That is a whole constructive paragraph. How are you supposed to construct your paragraphs? There is an ACE method that I would like to recommend. Number one, you make an assertion. There is a statement you're saying. Online learning is ineffective because it can lead to rampant cheating due to the opening of external sources of help. That is an assertion you're making. Number two, you have content. You're going to be explaining what this assertion is about. For example, because a teacher is unable to be physically present next to the student watching all of their moves during an online examination, the likelihood of a student being able to conduct and get away with cheating is much higher. Small explanation. Example, students can use Google Translate for a language examination. Students can use built-in language editors like Grammarly to check their grammar. Students can talk to their friends and do the examination together in a collaborative manner, which is not how exams are meant to be conducted. So in that sense, you've done the A, C, E approach. You have your assertion, one line. You have C, which is the content of what your assertion is talking about. And you have E, which is an example. Another thing that's very important for writing is your introduction and your conclusion. I remember that when I was writing my TOEFL, I spent most of my time really trying to make sure that the introduction and conclusion were snappy, concise, and showed my position on the argument. Am I for it? Am I against it? Why? And I tried to summarize the three main arguments I talk about in my writing section in that introduction. So if I was to write an introduction, I would set context today with COVID-19 being a potent threat to conducting in-person examinations, students are being forced to take their exams online. Because of the following reasons, this, 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 I believe that online learning is ineffective in trying to administer test taking in students' houses. So that is a very simple introduction that gives a whole summary of what you're going to be talking about. It outlines three constructive arguments and it also sets a context. In what world are you talking about these reasons? So that is how I think you should mold an introduction. In the conclusion, restate your points, restate your arguments and make sure you're ending with a line that is snappy, that is concise and leaves an impact on a reader. I think that TOEFL examiners at the end of the day are humans. They're going to unintentionally judge you on the basis of your first impression, on the basis of the last impression. So making sure that those paragraphs are impressive, making sure that they're conclusive, making sure that they're able to summarize your entire passage. Those are all very, very key things to keep in mind when you're writing your introduction and conclusion. And in the body, you want to make sure you again have structure. You again have paragraph one talking about ACE, paragraph two, ACE, paragraph three, a, C, E. So that was everything I had for the writing section. And that summarizes what I think got me a 120 on 120 on the TOEFL. If you are new here, please consider subscribing. There's a little bell icon, not bell icon. It's a red button um, <laughs> on your screen below. Uh, consider hitting it. And I will be back on Wednesday for a new video.